So I think anything, especially in generative AI space in our industry, is sort of 50% anxiety, 50% excitement. We were spending some time with all of the young talent. <laughs> what an exciting moment, right? If you're sort of in the moment of defining your own path and career and you see that interact and intersect with massive changes, that's where the excitement and anxiety balance comes in. But for me, if you're not excited about these types of moments, then you shouldn't be in the industry. Because for good or bad, that's what we sort of do. A thing happens, we have to figure it out. And because we're on the front lines of it, the fact that we're figuring out gives us a surprisingly large impact on defining what it actually does and is. Welcome back to Created for Creatives the podcast where creatives talk about, well, creative. I'm Corinne O'Keefe, your host for this episode, coming to you from the jury rooms of the London International Awards in Las Vegas. Wesley Terhar is the founder of Media Monks in LA, and Om Udamde is the chief executive officer and creative founder at Yell Advertising in Bangkok. They're both judges in the evolution and creativity in the metaverse juries. Wesley founded Media Monks 22 years ago, not that you'd know it. I have a really good skincare routine. People on podcasts <laughs> won't see this, but you hardly notice it. He does. It's Thank amazing. <laughs> it is actually quite good. <laughs> Got into the space when I was about 19. Really just the excitement of seeing a new medium, which at that time was the internet, becoming available at the consumer level. And I was at that moment in time studying communications, and I felt I was studying things that didn't make any sense in where the world was going. So that sort of spurred me on to get into the space and then a few years later uh, start Media Monks. Got it. And Om, what got you into the industry? Actually, we are very keen in the Southeast Asia market. As an Asian people, I think I have a strongly understand about the insight in ASEAN. In Yale, we call the way we work effectively creative because we are focusing in effectiveness for our client also. I say to my people every day, we don't do advertising, but we solve uh, the client's problem by communication. Got it. So it was the problem-solving aspect of it that really drew you to it? Yes, we love to face the problem. <laughs> love that. Before we dive in and start talking about the work we're seeing coming out of the jury room, what's one campaign um, that both of you have done that you're the most proud of? Actually, I love all campaigns, but... If we talk about one of my favorites, uh, it is uh, the campaign called The One Card. This is the short film and digital campaign for The One Card, the loyalty program in Bangkok, Thailand. It's not about like a, how many trophies that I got from that campaign, but it's about the standard that I set to my team after this campaign launch, which we call the change the room temperature rule. It means uh, we can uh, validate a good idea when you can change the room temperature in presentation. Very cool. And Wes, how about you? Uh, none of my work got through the first round here. <laughs> I'm proud of none of it. None of it changed the room temperature. Uh, <laughs> I think uh, in the context of what we are judging today, I thought the work we did last year for Getty Museum, Persopolis Reimagined, which was like physical, digital, super tactile. I didn't do it myself. But the team that worked on it, I think, did an amazing job on that. I thought it was really beautiful. Nice. Very cool. And so before we kind of dive in, obviously, a lot of what we'll talk about is very technology-focused. Wes, you are the self-proclaimed AI guy <laughs> yes. at your place. But let's talk about creativity first, storytelling. What impact do you think it has on our industry, and why do you think it's so important? So I have slides where I... I sort of, I'm not that positive about the term storytelling because I think sometimes it forces our industry into very traditional linear ways of thinking. So for me, it's storytelling in the context of a channel or a technology or user behavior to me is super interesting. But I sometimes struggle with the term because I, I think people default to what has been the dominant form of storytelling for our generation, which is film. Where I think storytelling, if you look at the current dominant form of entertainment, is really gaming, which is interactive, it's tactile, it's responsive to what you do. So storytelling, but in the context of, I think it's important. That's really interesting, nonlinear storytelling. And so speaking of entertainment, going on to kind of a different technology beyond gaming. So, Ohm, you've done quite a lot in the AI space as well. 
Recently, the Hollywood writers have just wrapped up their strike, and in part, that strike was due to concerns about AI and its impact on sort of their creativity and their industry and what that would mean in terms of their own limitations. So what do you feel the role of AI is in the creative industry such as our own, and how have you been leaning into that? Honestly, it should enhance us, but not replace us. Because AI can't ask to adjust the brief and objective like us. So I think uh, for the thing that happened with Hollywood writers and actors recently, this is uh, the first step to the new era of using AI. But I believe in human, and I am sure that we can pass it as our way that we passed it before. Yeah, it is all about the humans. But I think we've seen from our entries that AI is definitely infiltrating its way into all the things we're creating for humans. So do either of you feel that there are industry concerns about AI or will it help the industry? What's your general perspective? I cannot wait to be replaced by AI. (laughs) That's my whole... (laughs) As long as we still get the paycheck, right? (laughs) That would be lovely. So I think... Anything, especially in generative AI space in our industry, is sort of 50% anxiety, 50% excitement. The excitement is, especially from a digital perspective, we have pitched or been pitched a story about digital advertising ecosystems that is a version of personalization at massive scale in real time, high in context conversational. That's never been delivered on for a variety of reasons, but a huge part of that is just the the amount of output you would need to actually be able to do that well. So for me, generative AI is the first time we've had a technology that at least gets us a lot closer to that promise. That's the excitement. I think where the anxiety comes from, I do think, and historically we've seen that in any space where AI sort of starts encroaching on human experience and expertise, there are things that the AI will start doing that are currently human jobs. I think sometimes it's easy for us to go, it gives me more time. Yes, but it is potentially impactful on more junior roles. I can see a space where it gets more difficult for juniors to break through because people would default more to machines for roles that used to be part of our model, right? You sort of come through the ranks. The question is, are those ranks still going to be there? This isn't a next year problem, but five years from now. Right. We're in the early waves of what the technology does, and it's already quite powerful. So. Yeah, some people are calling it the deindustrialization of creativity era. So taking on some of those things, I think to your point, it's how do we evolve what those juniors are doing or what we're asking them to do as opposed mm-hmm. to just replacing what they're doing. It will be interesting to see. Yeah, and, and honestly, the flip side of that is some of our younger talent is more excited, more adept at using the machine. So maybe the term junior becomes more of a reflection of how good people are with the machines. Because I've been in a lot of these types of discussions over the last year, year and a half. You can look at pretty much every space that AI has impacted or influenced, and everybody always says the same thing at the start, which is it's about the humans. And then later on, humans are still there, but they don't necessarily outcompete the machines anymore, which makes it more difficult to break through an industry like ours, which is really apprenticeship model. So yeah, I think that to me is the anxiety piece. What does it mean for career paths, apprenticeship models? Yeah, makes sense. So the reason we're even talking about this is because we're collectively judging the evolution category, which is about where is our industry going? What's next? And obviously AI is where we are going inevitably, or at least where a lot of things are going, powered by or driven by or forced by um, it. But Should LIA and other awards shows consider an AI category in and of itself? And follow-up question, who would judge it? Would it be AI? (laughs) Speaking of replacing ourselves, would it be AI judging the category itself? Oh, crazy. (laughs) You know, uh, for for me, uh, technology is here and will be a part of us as always. I think... It should be just a a subcategory under the evolution or like a creative innovation category because uh, last year, the metaverse, and for this year, AI, and next year, what is the new buzzword for us? So no need to like uh, create uh, like uh, the new category every year to follow up the trends. Because uh, after I listen to Wesley like uh, answer, I think it's about the fundamental. It's about like a, how good you are and uh, 
everything comes and go. So no need for like a create a specific AI new category. AI cannot change your brief, so AI cannot do like a, as far as you do. Yeah, I think that's a really interesting point. So taking a step back and actually to that point, um, creativity in the metaverse is one of the other categories that we're judging. Wes, you and I both judged this category last year. So what do you think? I mean, evolution from last year to this year, is the metaverse itself over? <laughs> Was Zuck wrong? What do we think? Well, I, I wouldn't bet against Zuckerberg. That's, <laughs> that's not been a winning proposition for a while now. But... I think there's a few parts to this. One, last year, clearly um, a category that was more popular from a submission perspective, but the work was, I think, less defined because there was a lot of people just doing something in Roblox or doing something in Decentraland. So we're seeing a smaller amount of submissions, but probably higher definition of why the work is there. Is it over? I think our industry sort of lives and dies by hype cycles a bit means we collectively overinvest in something when it's not ready to be invested in and then tend to underinvest for a few years when it's actually growing steadily. For me, it's always been about what's the underlying sort of user behavior or human instinct that's driving some of that. And for me, while there's a lot of components, uh, Web3 and Metaverse, that I feel are sort of sucked into that hype cycle discussion. The reality is people are spending more time online. And especially for younger generations, the time they spend online is as valuable as time spent in real life, right? I think that's when I spend time on my phone, I still feel like I'm wasting my time. That's a me and my generation issue. So if you think about time spent in digital spaces as valuable, it's not strange that people are spending some of that time in more tactile environments. Makes sense. Does it make sense that people are spending money on digital goods? It makes sense if you tie it back to that human behavior. So I think the human behavior is clear. I think the knowledge was a little early to invest in as heavily as it was invested in by marketeers over the last few years. Still exciting to see the progress. Meta driving a lot of it. Uh, vision from Apple will be super interesting to see how that lands at scale. There's still a lot of uptick in sort of gaming-like metaverse environments. So I think we're in that trow of disillusionment, I think is the official term. And it'll take a few years. But I think the underlying human behavior is trending towards that space still. Yeah, it's a Mars law, right? Technology is always overestimated in the short term and underestimated in the long term. Yeah. And I think what we've seen, and I agree with you, last year, so many more submissions. This year, much better quality. A lot of it probably comes back to you. We could never agree on what metaverse actually meant. <laughs> it kind of became this dump all of all things that were sort of in the hype cycle. For me, I say good riddance hype train. I'm glad that it's left the station and that we've now moved our fixation onto AI because now we can get to the good stuff, which are the experiences of true value that are building on and the technology and what we've seen sort of coming out of it while it's limited. The rules are being written right now, what this space will become. And so the people who are really in those spaces right now, at least from my perspective, are the ones who are starting to actually build upon the foundations that aren't hype. And that's where that work can continue while we're all now fixated on the next shiny thing. And um, to your point, whatever that is next year that we come back to. But I think let's get to some of the work because we are judging the evolution category. And so by definition, the category is really work that makes you rethink how things can be done, work that points to new ways forward, ideas that move away from status quo and break new barriers. So for both of you, as you've been judging, what have you been looking for? <laughs> For me, I'm looking for an idea that change the room temperature. <laughs> it is uh, the combination of uh, like a why we should solve this problem, how creative ideas do for the brand, and what is the best in class execution. I think from that reason, it make uh, everything move away from the status quo. For me, it is unexpected things that feel extremely logical because I'm looking at things that can scale, right? And it can scale if it isn't a logical thing to do, but it's not a winner for me if it isn't unexpected. So it's those two combinations to me feel, they're sort of the aha moments for me. Where I'm like, oh, but of course, 
right? That sort of the balance I always look for in these types of discussions. Logically unexpected. I love yeah. that. And moving mm-hmm. away from status quo, I think both of those things are really about that idea of rethinking, which interestingly enough could be an idea or a technology. And I think we've seen both. But yeah. with that, what buzz in the jury room have <laughs> both of you been loving? What conversations have you found quite interesting? Oh, I think we are all like a very curious people <laughs> i think almost of the bars in the, the jury room uh, start with a uh, why this is a very good to find the reason behind the work like wesley mentioned it's about like uh, the logical behind that about like uh, the output that uh, make us feel like oh i like it <laughs> or i don't like it <laughs> uh, but the uh, i think the discussion has been fun right it's a very mature jury and I, I think sort of digging in because that that maybe sometimes is the challenge of evolution is you might be looking at things that aren't completely baked yet but a hint of things to come so the balancing act between is this too stunty for that or is it actually something that points to what the future would potentially look or feel like that to me is uh, the most interesting part of the conversation and then sometimes it just which historically I always think is the, the coolest thing of judging is you'll sit there and you've given something a two and then somebody says something you're like, I was wrong, it's an eight, which is sort of funny. So I, I always enjoy that massively. And I think this jury, the conversation has been really high quality, which yeah, is fun. Yeah, that's my favorite part, changing hearts and minds. But it's the discussion because yeah. as you said, it's not like a typical jury where it's here's what we did, here's the problem mm. we solved, here's mm. the impact. Mm. A lot of our conversations have been application versus implication yeah. what's the implication or where could this lead us either culturally or industry wise and there has been so much interesting discussion where as you said i think a lot of us have done a lot of 180s based off of what people have said and and the way that they're looking at it and that's the beauty of a really diverse jury room is that yeah. we all bring these different perspectives on it but we would be remiss to not talk about the AI work that I think we've seen so far. It's yeah. having its moment. We're in its current hype cycle, whether that is, you know, people are saying it's iPhone moment, as they say. So which of the work that you both have seen so far has stood out to you? AI specifically. AI specifically. So we're definitely seeing a lot of, and we use AI case videos where I think AI in its current sort of use case is most interesting is when it's scaling something and making something possible that otherwise just wouldn't be available. And I think we've seen a lot of pieces where it's literally just, we did this with AI and you look at it and you go, but you could have done that without AI. But there are a few cases where AI is actually the unlock. It's we would not have been able to put this in front of people or in front of as many people without the technology. That to me is the the use case I'm currently looking for when it comes to AI. Totally agree with Wes. I'm looking forward to finding the AI that helps us to solve the exact problem, not just a like a bandwagon campaign. So that's why we have a, a lot of discussion about should uh, implement AI in this case, or we have a, like a, the other way that's smarter to do this campaign to solve the problem. Yeah, I think to that point specifically, one that's really struck me in terms of intentional use of AI has been the one where they are um, actually taking refugee stories and using generative AI to actually visualize the stories. And they played the case film, and I remember it stopped and the whole room was just silent. It's and a beautiful piece of work. For that work, like uh, some juries changed my mind because at the first time, I did not think about how to scaling like uh, the idea from that. I just think, oh, this is uh, like an AI creator, some art piece, right? But when uh, somebody mentioned about like uh, the scaling from a uh, refugee, I think, oh, it's very beautiful. You can cross border, you can uh, explore more, like anything to use the AI to like enhance the idea. I think uh, the beauty of discussion in our jury room is about that. Sometimes I got the new idea from other juries, and sometimes I think, oh, I'm wrong already. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great example of, of making something available that otherwise would not be made available and doing it in a way that we know has impacted policy and people's mindsets in the past. And it's also where the AI discussion sort of hits its 
sort of edgy what is correct and what is incorrect in the use case, especially when you think about evolution and what's pointing to the future, like that conversation, that's the conversation. Beyond AI, what else work-wise or trend-wise have you seen that really excited you in terms of where the industry is going? Uh, I think this year AI is a bust, right? Come back to like uh, my belief, I believe in human and we have undergone many changes in our history. So in the advertising industry, I also believe in creativity. The true enemy of advertising is stagnation. AI is not your enemy, but your stagnation is your enemy. Maybe for this year is AI thing, but next year is another thing, right? But uh, no matter what is will come in, but I'm ready for it. <laughs> so, especially having sort of uh, seen the evolution of that type of work, I'm super impressed by brand action as a category this year. Seeing so many scalable programs versus the stunty stuff that we saw back in the day. So I think brand action, I'm super impressed and I'm sort of struggling to see how we would even be able to get that over the line because there are so many, I think, awards in there potentially. So that's been, I think, super impressive. A few of these AI cases, especially the photojournalism one, I just think is is one of the more interesting pieces. So if you look at Bill to Basis, for instance, which I'm not 100% sure will do really well in this category, but as a piece of work, I'm just a massive sucker for like the platform hack. So this is the case where they did a donation drive by starting a Twitch stream and then getting people to use their three and a half dollars in their Prime account, that's free to donate to that Twitch stream. So it's it's a, like a, a donation drive, but you're donating Bezos' money. So nobody's losing money, but you literally bill it to Bezos. I love that type of hack and uh, finding that must be the moment where you're like, we cracked it. And of course, Amazon shut it down. So that's always the sign that you did something quite well. It was, it was brilliant, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they found a way, to, it was like an Amazon prime perk yeah. and obviously there's a lot of conversation around bezos billionaires how they don't give back mm. and so they found this hack through this twitch mm. functionality where they could take that money that you would normally would donate to a streamer and to actually donate it to charity where yeah. they could force his money because otherwise they, he just keeps the money yeah. and so they did this whole campaign <laughs> around it and that, the whole from an evolution perspective that sort of fight back against the billionaires piece i told captures the mood a bit you know, in Asia, it's uh, totally different. Because if you are the rich people like uh, Bezos, and you have a lot of money like this, nobody yeah. can bring uh, the money back from your pocket. <laughs> yeah, uh, It used to be that in the US as well, right? That sort of perspective. Yeah. But I think a lot yes. has changed over the last few years. So I think they tapped into the populist vibe quite well yes. with that. I think that's why it's wonderful to have a, like a diversified juries in our room because we have a, a lot of perspective from uh, around the world. I think this is a wonderful thing in, uh, in Lear. Yeah, mm -hmm. I agree. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree. I agree with you on the brand action piece. Yeah. I think the work in that subcategory is outstanding. Mm -hmm. And for me, what was so exciting, again, what its implication to the industry is, is that it's not all purpose-based. And I think we're moving past that where the brands, the actions that they're doing are really fundamentally intertwined with what their purpose or their intent in the world is, either their product or what they stand for, which you're right, it's going to be a really interesting discussion. Super heavy category, but it's a good point. Like it's, it's moved beyond the general vagueness of purpose into like really business transformational type stuff, which is really interesting to see. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Anything that either of you would like to add? I think I love everything in this industry because I saw that everything is always changing. And uh, from the last question about like the work that I have seen and connect to this question, uh, I think it's about like uh, the action from the brand, from the advertising agency that implement into the campaign, I think it's very, it's always interesting for me. So I think uh, it's depend on uh, like uh, the madmen like us to like, <laughs> to have to adapt ourselves in everything. So for me, uh, I think I am like a uh, too optimistic, <laughs> but 
I believe in that. Even though uh, like uh, I'm coming here and I found a lot of uh, very good people in here, and I learn a lot from Leah every year that I came here. It's a very beautiful moment for me. And if anything that I want to add, lifelong learning, it should be like a, in our heart because uh, we face the new thing every year. Last year and this year is not the same for me. <laughs> so that's what I love it. Yeah, mm. I love that. Well, that's what AI can't replace yet. <laughs> and it's always the most fun piece. And honestly, we, we were spending some time yesterday in the, the room with all of the young talent. What an exciting moment, right? If you're sort of in the moment of defining your own path and career and you, you sort of see that interact and intersect with massive changes, that's where the excitement and anxiety balance comes in. But for me, if you're not excited about these types of moments, then you shouldn't be in the industry because that's for good or bad, that's what we sort of do. A thing happens, we have to figure it out. And because we're on the front lines of it, the fact that we're figuring out gives us a surprisingly large impact on defining what it actually does and is, right? And this is probably the most meaningful one of those moments that I've seen in the 22 years that MediaMonks has existed. So yeah, it's, it's exciting, it's fun. I agree with you. I mean, we're creative problem solvers at the end of the day. And I'm optimistic, as you are, Om. I really think we have our most creative days ahead of us, and I can't wait to see it. And I also can't wait to have our debate tomorrow. But thank you both. Thanks for sharing your perspective. Appreciate it. Fun Appreciate chat. it. Thank you so much. Wesley Tahar is the founder of Media Monks in L.A., and Om Udamde is the chief executive officer and creative founder at Yale Advertising in Bangkok. They're both judges in the 2023 London International Awards. I'm Kryn O'Keefe, the chief creative officer of Digitas UK, one of the hosts for Created for Creatives. The producer is Sarah Knights. The theme music is by Brian Yessian of Yessian Music. The manager is Larissa Levy from the London International Awards. This podcast is an eardrum production. 